folks here uh, that um, weren't able to, well, we'll do this sessions and then we'll catch up on last sessions too. So um, I'm gonna stop share so we can see faces. Uh, Asia and Chilton, are you guys ready to introduce each other? Asia, you're um, muted. Okay, uh, so uh, Chilton, he's from uh, Austin. He likes lacrosse he likes like bass fishing he he um fishes with topwater lures and he also likes uh, trout fishing nice excellent does he have a nickname a uh, chill chill <laughs> okay awesome chill would you like to introduce asia please um, <clears throat> I didn't get that part done because in the email, uh, the phone number was wrong. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. Uh, so. I sent in my other phone number, so we might talk later today. Okay, good. Next time, I'm going to have you introduce Isha then. How Got about, it. um, okay, I know, f uh, Wyatt, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, Wyatt's here. Awesome. You want to introduce Finn? Yeah, I have his notes, but I don't think he's on here. But Yeah, I don't think he is either. But let's go ahead and have you introduce yeah. him. Okay. So um, Finn was born in Colombia, and then he was adopted when he was three months old. His favorite place to fish is Walden. His dream fishing place is in Alaska. Um. A lot, something that a lot of people don't know about him is that he's never home. He wants to be a football or basketball player. His biggest role model are his neighbors. And his favorite non-fishing hobby are sports. Cool. Thank you. That's a great introduction, too. Um, what about Tanner and Parker? Parker is not here. He's fishing the San Juan with his he mom, is. So. Well, yeah. what a stinker. What a stinker. <laughs> okay, then let's move back to the other session. Audrey and Trevor? Yeah, I can go. Okay, thank you, Audrey. So my partner is Trevor, and he lives in Highlands Ranch. He has a little sister. And next year, he's going into his junior year at Mountain Vista High School. Um, he mostly bass fishes, but he's been around fly fishing since he was really little, and he kind of wants to get into it a little bit more, which is why he's doing this camp. Um, he also plays hockey and is an Avalanches fan. And he's, like, the type of person to prefer a vacation to a lake versus, like, a beach vacation in California. Nice. Thank you. Great introduction also. Trevor. Yeah, so I had Audrey. So Audrey, she's 17. She lives in Evergreen, Colorado. She has a dog and she's involved in the plays at her school and she's on the improv comedy team. And she's still learning about fly fishing, but she joined this camp to hopefully learn more because she really enjoys it. Cool. You guys all have very interesting hobbies besides fishing. I'm really happy to learn these things about you. Uh, okay, uh, Xander and Brody. Are you guys ready to introduce each other? I already introduced Brody last week. So. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Xander. How about Brody? Are you, go are you ready to um, introduce Xander? Yeah, when me and Xander did the call, we didn't do like the structured kind of thing. He just told me like his story. So is that all right if I... Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so, so... Whatever you want to do. Okay. Um... So Xander's 14 years old and he lives in Pennsylvania <clears throat> and um, he grew up or he started fly fishing when he was like eight and um, he learned to fly fish on the Delaware River and um, his biggest accomplishment um, is catching um, 
sorry, his biggest fish he's caught on a fly rod was a 19 and a half inch shad, which I don't even know how shad get that big, but. <laughs> In Pennsylvania, they do apparently. Yeah. Um, <laughs> his favorite thing to do besides fishing is play pickleball. He says it's kind of like uh, tennis, but I don't really understand what that could be. But um, uh, he learned, he took a lot of fly like lessons at LNL Bean. And um, his favorite fly to use is a streamer pattern. And he has a sister named Taylor. Nice. Thank you. Perfect. Um, Cooper and Grant. <laughs> Um, you guys want to introduce each other? Do we have Grant here? You guys on? Cooper, you are. Cooper, have you had an opportunity to talk to Grant? Yeah, I talked to Grant. I don't think he's here right now, but I can still introduce him. Why don't you go ahead and introduce him? Okay, uh, Grant 17, he's a rising senior in high school. Uh, he's from Littleton, Colorado. Uh, he loves to fly fish. He's been fly fishing for four or five years, he said. Um, he also likes to hunt. He's hoping to get a, an elk tag for this summer or this winter, in this fall. Um, and he found out that uh, he's an Eagle Scout and he found out about this camp when he was searching for an Eagle Scout project. Very cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. So we'll have the folks that weren't here catch up next session and hopefully knock out all of the introductions. Um, Larry, do you want to um, talk about the watershed definitions game we played and the winners? Larry. Okay, we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay. oh, there you are. Excellent. Sorry about that. Took a, a call from my friend in Thailand. So Larry, would you like to introduce the um, winners from last week's watershed definitions game? I'd love to if I'd found them to be able to introduce, introduce them. Um, I know um, Andrea sent me that they've been posted, but I didn't know exactly where. Oh, okay. We'll come back to that. Sorry about that. Um, so tonight, um, so last week when Larry gave, gave that presentation about watersheds, some of you were interested in doing a more detailed session uh, and learning more about watersheds and what makes up a watershed. And um, so that's scheduled for tonight. And I've sent you out uh, a Zoom link registration. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, Go ahead and register. It'll send you the Zoom information and then Larry will be able to know how many of you uh, want to follow up on that. And then Thursday night is going to be our watch party. Do you want to say briefly a little bit about the films, Larry, that you've got lined up? Yeah, so um, Craig Matthews has uh, shared some uh, footage that he's done for conservation project on the Madison. So we'll watch that. I have a... Uh, uh, video uh, from uh, RA that's uh, kind of a compilation of uh, different trips he took early in his career in the 07, 08 time frame. And then I also have uh, uh, Paul, who you'll hear from here in a little bit, they'll share some content mm -hmm. from a trip to, he had to Alaska. And then finally, I'm trying to get uh, Amin, mm -hmm. who you've seen in our first session, uh, and he did our video trailer. He just graduated from CU in uh, journalism. I know he's got some film and I'm gonna ask him to put up as well. So all told, probably about an hour's worth of, of film, uh, no more than an hour and 15 minutes, uh, but some things I'm sure you haven't seen and some of it's pretty spectacular. Very cool, excellent. Thank you, Larry. Um, looks like a lot of you 
uh, were busy the last week doing some of the um, do-it-yourself activities. So I just wanted to share a few things. And if you got, if anybody that wants to speak up, I'd love it. Um, so one of our activities was the Healthy Rivers Art Contest. Right now we have one submission uh, from Kate. Uh, Every healthy river has a little bit of magic beneath it. Kate, would you like to say anything about this and what inspired you um, to do this illustration? Uh, sure. So one of the things that um, I really believe in is I, I actually love to write and um, one of the things I love writing is fantasy books and um, when I'm walking out in nature there's like no better place to come up with ideas because nature is cool in a way that it inspires every little bit of magic and it's really incredible how you can look around and like even in the smallest things such as like the trickle of a waterfall or the feel of the grass beneath your feet those little things are the things that can really inspire new worlds um and like that's just one of the things I think of when I'm outside is um books for ideas mm -hmm. for stories and um that's kind of what I mean by the mm -hmm. art piece. Yeah. Nice, nice. I really like um, the, the dimensions that you put in here and that you even have the roots um, beneath the trees and we can see like how everything is tied together, whether it's beneath the surface of the ground into the, you know, at all the layers up into, you even have the sky comp captured here. So this is awesome. I hope some other people feel creative um, because you've got a great head start on winning the Healthy Rivers Art, Art Contest right now. <laughs> and it looks like you also tell us the story behind this photo. Okay, so I um, go on trash pickups every 22nd and I've been doing that since Earth Day because Earth Day was on a 22nd. Um, I get together some of my friends and we go on trash pickups I'm actually part of a nonprofit organization that help, is helping to protect the oceans, which is um, one of the fundamental parts of rivers mm -hmm. and streams. Um, and those are one of the things that we do is that um, we go on trash pickups. We ended up picking about five, uh, about five pounds of trash in um, Denver. And um, I do it every 22nd, so yeah. For a second there, I, I thought you meant every 20 seconds. <laughs> How do you do that? I have a question for Kate. Which ocean group are you part of? Um, Generation Ocean. It's a, nice. it's a smaller group. It's a bunch of kids, actually, who want to give the ocean a better future than it has now. Cool. I used to work for, uh, maybe you've heard of Colorado Ocean Coalition. Um they are based out of Colorado. Yeah, yeah, they do partnerships with like kind of the dive shops in Boulder. And mm -hmm. there's there's a big ocean advocacy kind of movement with some of the inland states because like you said, it we're the headwaters. So we start yeah. we start the um the behaviors that mm -hmm. kind of lead downstream to others. So that's so cool. I love that. I love that yeah. connection. Thanks. Thank you, Kate, for sharing that. That's really neat that you do that every year, every month on the 22nd. That's a super idea for all of us um, to take a little bit of time and do something where, where we're cleaning up and doing giving something back every uh, on a regular basis. Um, if you want to see, like, look at these things more carefully, then on the session two drop down is where I created this page for the submissions. Looks like a lot of you uh, watch the Way of the Trout video. Um, and this is a great kind of pre, um, I know, pre activity to today's subject of talking about trout rearing and native species conservation to do with cutthroats today. But, um, 
there's a lot of great comments here. It looks like people got a lot out of this video. Um, maybe um, a couple of you would like to speak up and say like what you what you liked about this video, share it with others, uh, and what what you learned you know that was surprising from this video. Carson, would you mind speaking up? Yeah, so let me get over to that page real quick. Oh, yeah, and I can just kind of pull it up. Oh, all right. So I learned the process in which uh, trout spawn and how the eggs are hatched and um, how lucky each egg is to survive with all the natural predators like current. And um, I think one of them was um, water scorpions. I'm not sure what that is. Um, uh, and then the video also showed how picky trout can be. So okay. when they, when they look at a fly and, uh, like, I'm not sure what the, uh, main guy's name was, but, uh, he had to throw like six dozen different patterns on the dry fly just to, uh, like make sure, um, he was able to get exactly what was hatching. Uh -huh. And when when he kind of figured it out, once he tied it, once he was able to lay it right on top of the fish, then the fish was able to rise. But um, yeah, I thought that was really cool. And one thing that um, I would have liked to see is if um, the spawning process or the uh, maturation of eggs was different among different trout species, like brook, rainbow, brown, trout. <laughs> Okay, yeah. well, maybe one of our guests can comment on that one um, in a little bit here, because um, we're going to be talking about that uh, some more this morning. Um, let's see here. Marcus, would you like to comment on your, your, your thoughts on this video and um, what was new to you? Uh, yeah, I know that they could like like learn uh, from the like past experiences. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it is pretty amazing, right? They got a yeah. Very good. That's awesome. Um, okay, so who's gotten out and uh, on a stream walk and looking at um, scavenger hunt pieces this past week? Well, I've done a stream rock. I haven't necessarily done the scavenger hunt, but um, I did write a poem about the stream. That you I did? Went on. Yeah, I can share it if you'd like would, me to. If you would like to, we'd love to hear it. Okay. Okay, it goes like, Walking down the river bend, cool grass grazing the ground, I think of things with no end of how in nature you can be both lost and found. How birds chirping in aspen trees can seem so serene, while fish flying flasks begin to flee beneath pure waters perfect and clean. How every cave on the mountainside holds secrets dark and lost, how humans can idly chide without considering the brutal costs. How worlds of creatures go unheard beneath an ever-burning sky. How we can stay alone and assured, nature held by chains of reality, unable to stand up and fly. Take that step, become a leap, for progress is great and small. Look, in, look around at the world so we may keep this love for this earth that protects us all. That's it. Beautiful. Awesome. Wow. What is some of those sentiments? How does that make some of the rest of you feel, hearing those sentiments? Anybody it's like to cool because I suck at writing poetry and like we have to in English class for our units or whatever and I can like never do it. So it's cool that she can just do it like as a hobby. <laughs> it's a gift, isn't it? It's a way of taking all the words out of words, right? And coming down to the essence of uh, what's to be said and there's a real art to it. Yeah, I think that was beautiful, Kate. Thank you for sharing it. That's really, really nice. Um, Thank you. Chris, it looked like you went out um, and made some observations having to do with the scavenger hunt. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Uh, yeah, so I, I was just on a river and I saw a couple aquatic bugs and I took pictures of them. Uh-huh. 
yeah. what did you see uh i saw a salmon fly and just a mayfly very cool yep nice did you see adults or uh um or the aquatics uh they were adults yep and how um how did you um identify them uh just like I don't know, past experience, I guess. I don't know. Uh -huh. I, I don't know. I learned about it in like a couple of videos, I think. I don't know. Okay. Just, like on Instagram everywhere and that helps me identify which bugs they uh -huh. are. Nice. All right. Jonathan, you're raising your hand. You're very polite. Oh, uh, yeah. I went on a stream walk this week. Great. What did, and where did you go? Um, well, I went to a few different streams in the, it's the Santa Fe National Forest, so down to the East Fork, the Rio Guadalupe, and the Rio Savoia, but they all kind of had the same uh, stream structure and uh, hatches and bugs. Oh, nice. And what did you, what kind of uh, structures did you see? Um, it was lots so the East Fork had a lot of boulders, so a lot of uh, cuts in the, like, the, lots of, like, waterfalls, so there are a lot of deep pools. They're very small. Um, and then there's a lot of pocket water behind small boulders uh -huh. the, the, to hold. Um, so then that was kind of transferred over into the smaller streams, and then the Rio Savoia flows into the Rio Guadalupe, and that one had the same, oh, uh, it was a little bit more flat, but it had a lot of structure in terms of pocket water. Nice. What is it you say you caught again? Oh, I caught just brown trout. Okay. They're all brown trout you fishers. what pocket water is? Pardon? Does everybody know what pocket water is? I guess everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say pocket water is um, uh, usually in a, in a stream bed with uh, small boulders and rocks and sometimes very large boulders and rocks uh, creates little, uh, uh, little pockets of water behind uh, and in front of and among those rocks and boulders and uh, provides great holding water for uh, trout. And we can talk about that more tonight as well in our watershed update. Yeah. Jonathan, what kind of flies were you using? Uh, a couple different caddis imitations. So they really, they kind of weren't too picky, but. Uh, right. I got them to eat on a regular caddis, an elk hair caddis. Uh, and then uh, they really like the bleached wing elk hair caddis. So like bleached elk hair. Oh, nice. So dry flies. Yeah. yeah, and then also in some of the deep pools, I got them to turn on a Euro nymph, which was a it's a local pattern here. It's the uh -huh. variant, but oh, it's very nice like a caddis imitation. Very it, cool. It imitates a lot of stuff. Nice, nice, very good. Thank you. Um, so keep going out you guys get out on the streams and make your observations it looks like we have had observations made on the arkansas audrey's put a lot of uh scavenger hunt um images into the arkansas um uh, file and it looks like chris we're having a trouble loading what you did but we'll work on that you and i um, Chris started putting stuff into the South Platte. Um, so um, let's get some more things in here um, so that um, we have a comparison of different structures and things too um, to look at and discuss. So it looks like you guys have been doing a great job getting after some of the activities um, and keep doing it. You know, you can do any of the activities from any of the sessions um, in any order that you want, really. So there's some more today, and we'll talk about them at the end 
of, of the session too. So at this point in time, um, we're going to move on. We have two guests, we actually have three guests today um, that you're going to meet um, successively. Our first, uh, our, our first guest um, that you're going to meet is Andy Klaus. And Andy, uh, it works at the Mount Chavineau Fish Hatchery. He works for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, at Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, manages all the fish hatcheries in the state of Colorado. And uh, Andy's going to give us uh, a short tour, a virtual visit uh, to the Mount Chavineau Fish Hatchery where um, the, the, our, our stewards, all of our fish stewards are raising uh, some of the uh, native greenback cutthroats uh, from, uh, I believe from the, um, the Bear Creek drainage and, and probably some other fish too. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, uh, Andy, and I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna allow you um, can you make Andy Klaus a co-host, Andy? Yep. All right, thank you. And now, Andy, you can take it away. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, can you guys hear me all right? We can, I can. Okay. Uh, I know the lighting isn't that great in here, but uh, yeah, I've been, I've been working at the Mount Chavano Fish Hatchery. Um, for about seven years. I've been working for Parks and Wildlife for about 10 years almost now. Um, uh, kind of how I got into this stuff is I've been, I've been obsessed with fishing ever since I was a kid. And uh, I didn't have a solid game plan when I was in high school. I got to college and discovered there was such a thing as a fish and wildlife degree. So I did that. I did fish and wildlife science. And uh, ever since I've been doing Fish related work. I did some fish fish work on the East Coast and then I moved out west and I've been in uh, Colorado ever since. So it's been great. Um, so for everybody, all you guys in high school, just know that these jobs are out there. They're good jobs and you work with good people. So keep that in mind and uh, get a game plan together before you start thinking about your future. Um, and I think what I want to do here is turn the camera around and start showing you guys all the stuff we have. And by all means, uh, interrupt me if you have any questions. But I'll show you, this is our isolation facility. Um, there we go. And this is, like Barbara said, this is where we raise all of our cutthroat trout. Um, in particular, all of our greenbacks are raised here. And this is the only facility that actually raises the greenback cutthroats. Um, this, it's called our isolation facility because it's on its own separate water source and we don't reuse the water. So the Mount Shavano Fish Hatchery has three separate hatchery buildings, this being one of them. The other two buildings are tied in with the rest of the, the facility, so we reuse the water on the other two. So it's got four separate rooms, uh, each of which we can kind of treat as their own little separate hatchery. Um, they're all full of fish right now. I'm gonna go to the first room where you'll see like the first stages of um, our, our fertilized eggs basically. And this is our newly built egg building here. So it'll be basically Devoted to egg handling, it's kind of mess here now. But devoted to egg handling, egg picking, exporting. That's the thing. Pretty exciting for us. So I know you used to rear uh, eggs up uh, at the top of the uh, pooter at the hatchery up there. Are you doing all your eggs now yourselves? Um, as far as so uh, the brood stocks go, they are all from either Zimmerman Lake on Cameron Pass, or right. they are from the Leadville National Fish Hatchery. Okay. We've taken student uh, 
uh, trips up to the hatchery up there, uh, uh, up the Poudre Canyon, and they used to have uh, do the hatching there and send them to uh, Fort Collins. But I guess you guys have taken that over. Yeah, we've taken over all the egg production. So nobody else receives the fertilized eggs other than us. Um, and the, the Poudre facility, they used to raise, or they used to have a brood stock, I think. They stopped doing that because they were on surface water and it was uh, kind of tricky. So, well, it's a little louder in here, but uh, I'm gonna show you back here. This is kind of where all the water comes in, this whole building. And um, this unit here is important to us because it's, it's a UV system that we treat the water with because these fish are super sensitive this uv system kills a lot of the bacteria and pathogens that may be coming into our water um, so that's that's important for these guys and their survival but basically this whole piping system water comes in right here goes up to the ceiling, and then it just kind of spider webs out into the four separate rooms. And is it from a spring or diverted uh, surface water? It's spring water. Cool. And then this is our um, incubator. And this one's a little different because we can control the temperature. So basically, we're trying to match the temperature of the brood stock. Uh, we got about 46 degrees. These fish came from the Leadville National Fish Hatchery. Um, they're just a bunch of different combinations. These are all greenbacks uh, of the Leadville brood stock. So we keep this water a little bit colder as they're developing. And then they go into the spring water, which is about 50 degrees or so. So Andy, all those trays have um, eggs in them? All these trays here are full of eggs. There's about 200,000 greenback wow. eggs in these trays right in front of us. And then I'm gonna pull out one of the trays and show you guys what the eggs look like at this stage. I have to set the tablet down. Maybe you can see this. Oh yeah. But uh, they're at the early, early stage of development and um, all the white eggs you see in there are the, the dead ones, but once they develop a little bit more, the first organ that you see are, are the eye, is the eye. So we call them eyed eggs, but these are a few weeks out at least till we get to that point. Do you um, do kind of maintenance on those trays and pull out the dead eggs? Uh, so once they reach the eyed egg uh -huh. stage, they're safe to handle. Right now, they're really fragile. They're fragile. Okay. Um, yeah. So at, at which point, when they've reached the eyed stage, we run them through a machine that actually picks out all the dead eggs and leaves the good ones. Oh, okay. Very cool. And then I was going to show you guys after they hatch and they turn into sack fry, uh, we just basically put them into these upwelling jars. Water comes in the bottom and uh, circulates them, keeps them on fresh water. Does everyone know what a sack fry is? Yeah, so a sack, a sack fry is uh, as soon as the fish hatch hatches, similar to like a chicken, a chicken egg, but they maintain the yolk sac after they hatch and they just kind of lay on their side. I wish I had an example to show you, but we don't have any on hand right now. Um, but anyways, these are the product of a year later. So these fish, would have been in that incubator pretty much a year ago. 
And these are all the, the greenbacks. These ones in particular uh, are from our Zimmerman brood stock. They're about five to six inches long. How long does it take to hatch out? Sorry? How long does it take to go from the egg to um, when they are, have consumed their yolk sac? Uh, I would say about a month, but that's, it's all dependent on water temperature. So oh, like yeah. that filler right. that I showed you, if we decrease the water temperature, uh, it, would, it would slow down the development. If we increase the water temperature, it would, it would uh, speed up the development. So a lot of the same here, but we have about 6,000 fish that are all going to be stocked out and do, they'll go to brood stocks at the Zimmerman Lake or Leadville. Very cool. And these are, these are the circulars that you got for us. Really handy. Um, they're kind of, they're self-cleaning. All the solid waste goes down to the bottom and right out the drain. And the greenbacks really like them because it's kind of like a constant, they get a constant flow. They stay active pretty much the whole time. These guys were jumping out, so we had to put screens on them. Yeah, so like um, campers, you guys understand that it's really unnatural to raise a trout in um, you know a kind of an aquarium setting like trout in the classroom or even in in hatcheries there's a lot of um, technology that goes into keeping these guys alive and trying to simulate um, circumstances that approximate the natural environment you guys have some questions for andy as he's walking between buildings How long does it take for them to be like full grown? So, uh, did you ask how long does it take for them to be full grown? Yeah, that was the question, yes. Um, well, those fish that I just showed you were a year old. And typically for Salmonids, we'll start using them for a brood stock. Um, about two years old, they're mature. But with these, it, growth is slower, it takes it takes a little bit longer. Uh, it kind of it kind of depends. It's definitely older than two years before we can really start spawning them. Nice. Andy, what was it like to transition from East Coast fisheries to Rocky Mountain fisheries? Uh, I did. I was doing uh, sturgeon re like a research project over there, so I didn't really work in any hatchery facilities. Um, as far as like Salmonids, I didn't really get any experience with them on the East Coast. Cool. But yeah, these are these are more than more of the same. Uh, these are some from the Leadville brood stock. You get an idea. I mean, there's six six thousand fish isn't a lot by our hatchery standards, but for the Bear Creeks, it is a significant number. Very cool. So um, students, uh, so he's showing you the greenback cutthroats. What are our other native species in Colorado? How many of you reviewed the salmonid species presentation? Uh, rainbow trout? Are they native or non-native? I don't think they're native. That's correct. So that would be a non-native species. Um, I think the is, okay. I know that the cutthroat trout is definitely native. Are there more, aren't there more species of um, cutthroat in Colorado than just the greenback, like the Rio Grande? Yeah, Rio Grande's one of them, that's right. The Colorado River cutthroat? The Colorado, yep, absolutely, that's correct, yep. Um, Chris said the yellowback, I think you mean yellow fin, and that is a, uh, well, it's thought to be extinct, um, with some of the research going on, who knows, but, but the yellowfin is an extinct one. And there's a recent 
uh, appearance. Um, does anybody know? Um, Kobe is sort of in your neck of the woods in South. Anybody know what the recent discovery is? No, not Snake River. Snake River is not a, a Colorado species. Wait, is the mountain whitefish a thing? Um, oh, we got all kinds of interesting things coming up on our thing. So the, the mountain whitefish is a native species to Colorado. The pike minnow is also a native species to Colorado, but neither of those are, are um, well, the pike minnow isn't a salmonid. Um, the new, um, the new trout that has been found is a San Juan um, cutthroat down in the southwest part of our state. Um, and we're going to hear a little bit more about some of the things that are going on there uh, in a few minutes. Um, Andy, did we see the whole situation? I, I didn't show you this last room, but it's more of uh, more of the smaller circulars. Okay. Trying to turn the camera around. Yeah, more of these smaller circulars with some of the uh, Leadville brood stock. Cool. How many fish in one of those circulars? There's a couple hundred. There's about 250 in each one. So we'll be stocking these guys out. We'll be getting rid of them by yeah. the beginning of next month. And start the um, process over again. Can you tell our campers how that stocking process works? Well, the stocking process, uh, usually it's just a matter of um, loading them into trucks and then we pump pure oxygen into the tanks. Um, and then depending on where they're going, you know, we'll take some of those up to Cameron Pass. So we'll hold them off feed for a couple days to reduce the stress on the, on the tank and haul them up there and, and uh, release them into the lake. Yeah. Cool. So we'll, a lot of them are headed for Zimmerman. <laughs> yep. Anybody been to Zimmerman Lake in Cam You know where that is in Cameron Pass, west of Fort Collins? It's a relatively easy hike from the highway, about a mile up, up the side of the mountain, and it's not too steep. Yeah, great. Thank you. We really appreciate uh, you showing us um, what's, what you're doing at Mount Chavano. Um, you guys know that a lot of the hatcheries in Colorado are open to visitors. And if you find yourself, uh, near one of our state fish hatcheries, you can do a self tour. Many of them have self tours. Um, and if you're there with your family, there's a good chance you could probably get a guided tour also. Um, they're really interesting. Uh, every hatchery has a different um, type of uh, aquaculture that they are focusing on. Uh, and there's a lot of really interesting cutting edge work being done in raising um, fish in captivity throughout the state of Colorado. So, very cool. Thank you, Andy. Thank uh, you. Any, any last questions for Andy before we let him go? I have a question. Sure, go ahead and ask it. I actually have a couple. Um, how big do uh, greenbacks get? Like, what's the, are they just like other trout? Do they just get as big as them or do they not grow as large? Generally, the cutthroats don't grow as large, especially if, you know, if you're familiar with fishing at High Mountain Lake, they're not, the fish don't get that big. These, these fish up at like the Net Leadville National Fish Hatchery, you know, eight to 10 inches is a pretty good size pretty good size greenback. Okay. And I, I didn't hear where do you usually stock these greenbacks? So these ones are going to be going for the most part to one of two places. They'll be going to the Leadville National Fish Hatchery for the brood stock there or Zimmerman Lake for the brood stock there. And Zimmerman Lake was, it was reclaimed. Um, all the fish that were there were removed for the sole purpose of putting bear creeks or greenbacks into that lake for a brood stock. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yep. Andy, we Andy, what's the, Andy, what's the difference in roles between the state fish hatchery and the national fish hatchery? Well, the Leadville fish hatchery, they, 
they, of course, they have the brood stock for the greenbacks. We don't have a brood stock here. We basically get rid of our fish after they're a year old. We raise them from a fertilized egg. So no brood stock here. The Leadville takes over that role. Um, Leadville also has, they have some other cutthroat species and they raise some rainbows as well. Um, they also have the boreal toads there. We don't have those. We have those in the, at uh, Monta Vista, but uh, those are the main differences between, between us and Leadville. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. All right, we really appreciate it. Um, hope everybody um, learned something new about raising trout. It's always really cool to see how these hatcheries are set up and the numbers, so just the sheer numbers of uh, fish that, that are raised. It's pretty exciting news. So thanks, Andy. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So um, before, Aisha, you had a question about how to tell the species apart. Dan Brow is going to speak a little bit more on that. So we're going to delay the answer to your question a minute. Um, Would you like my answer to it? Sure. <laughs> you look in their genes. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Good one. We have a... Audrey isn't laughing. Audrey's not laughing? Oh, man. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> I smiled. So, uh, so um, I think you guys are starting to figure out that Larry is our resident king of the dad joke. Uh, for camp. <laughs> so you can share all the Larry's jokes with your dads <laughs> and they will probably laugh. Um, mothers so we, don't seem to like them. I don't know what the problem is. I know, what's with us mothers? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have another guest today uh, and Larry, would you like to introduce Paul? Sure. Um, so we've been talking a lot about videos here today. We talked about the way of the trout. We're going to have the watch party uh, tomorrow night. And someone that's uh, always supported our uh, our camp from the beginning has been the uh, Fly Fishing Film Tour. And uh, with us today is Paul Nicoletti. He's a uh, new director for uh, the, uh, the film tour. And we'll be sharing some of his uh, uh, footage tomorrow night in our watch party. And... Um, Paul has a rich history of, you know, uh, working on youth uh, projects and can tell a little bit about his uh, background and history and what it's like to be a film tour, tour director. How's it going, everyone? So, uh, yeah, my name is Paul Nicoletti. Uh, currently, I help manage the fly fishing film tour. I'm a filmmaker. I used to teach AP environmental science. Um, I've guided in Alaska, Montana, and I also studied fisheries in college. It seems like most of you guys have a love for fishing and maybe a passion for conservation. So I'm just gonna spend the next 10 minutes or so telling you a little bit about my crazy journey, um, how I've been able to find really cool different jobs in the outdoor world and the fisheries world. And then um, kind of my hope is that you guys can learn from some of my experiences, but my real goal, and I'm serious about this, is that you guys can use me. So ask me questions if you're interested in internships, teaching opportunities, guide opportunities, let me know because I really want to help um, and I appreciate you guys being a part of this program. Uh, at the very end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but if you guys have any short video clips next time you guys go out fishing between 30 seconds to three minutes, um, I'm going to give Larry my email and if you guys want to send some of those videos over to me, we can, um, depending on what you send me, potentially put it up onto the Fly Fishing Film Tour Instagram and Facebook. Um, but I kind of want to tell you my story and there's a really good point to it at the end. But when I was in high school, uh, I figured out I wanted to study fisheries because literally there was nothing else I was passionate about. Uh, kind of like Noah who, uh, can't stop tying flies during this session. I was totally obsessed. And when I was in high school, I think I was probably the only one in my grade that cared about fishing. So I kind of felt like an oddball. And then I went out to the University of Montana for orientation when I was about 17 years old. And I was walking across campus with my father, staring down at this campus map. And my father, he's from the Bronx, so his name's Tony. He's got a really thick New York accent. And he just kind of stiff arms me as I'm staring down at this campus map. He goes, oh my God, Paul, forget about it. I know, I know it, you're going to school here. It's like, ugh, 
what is it, dad? And I looked up to my left and there was like 15 beautiful women and a couple guys that were taking casting lessons on the grass in the middle of the oval. And it was like a funny moment for me because at that time I realized that growing up in Connecticut when people didn't really like to fish, you know, that's one thing. But here in Montana, people love the outdoors. People want to fish. And that was it. Immediately decided I'm going to go out to school in Montana. And my angle was going to, going to school to, to study fisheries. I didn't want to just take normal college credits. I wanted to get a bunch of experience doing independent studies. And it was sweet. And I got to spend four years working on a bunch of really cool um, fisheries projects up in Glacier National Park, doing some genetic studies. I did some rod and reel sampling for bull trout in one of their last native ranges where they still are very successful. Um, and I got to do some gill, uh, gill netting work as well. And it was cool because in college, a lot of people take the easy route. And my route was, I just want experience. So I met tons of biologists. I got to build my resume, but it was weird because as I got more into my degree, I realized I loved conservation. I was obsessed with fly fishing, but I hated statistics. And although research and field work was really awesome, lab work wasn't really my cup of tea. So I started to expand my love for the outdoors by becoming a whitewater raft guide in the summers. Sorry. And can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Yes. Sorry. Sometimes when I get a call, my, my Bluetooth headset will switch. Um, and so I became a, a whitewater raft guide in the summers because although I really love the science and biology, I also just kind of wanted to be a fishing guide and I wanted to go explore. And it was one of the coolest parts of my life because I got a completely different set of skills, how to interact with people, how to row a raft. Um, I got to make some pretty decent tips and I met some of the coolest people in my life. Um, but I finished four years of college. And when I was done with my degree, I realized I didn't really want to become a biologist or a fisheries manager. It wasn't the right path for me. And I was only, only 23 at the time, but you know, as an adult, realizing you don't have it figured out is really scary. So I decided to take a completely different route because I still love conservation. So I started to teach AP environmental science. I started working um, teaching uh, outdoor education in Glacier National Park. And I just had two big, really lofty goals. One, I just wanted to inspire people to care about conservation. And two, I just wanted to work outside and fish as much as possible. And the more, it, the more and more I taught, the more and more I fell in love with it. And I found a really cool balance. I was able to teach four to five days a week. I was able to guide on the weekends. And I started to realize that being a fly fishing guide and teaching had a lot of similarities. I was still able to teach people about conservation. I was able to spend time outdoors with people and help develop a real emotional attachment to the places I loved, outdoors that I wanted to protect. And so it was like this cool part when I was 24 years old where I decided, wow, like maybe I can figure this out. Maybe I can find a balance. And then something kind of crazy happened. I was finishing um, a year of teaching AP environmental science and one of my best friends asked me if I wanted to go guide in Alaska. Um, I don't know what you guys know about guiding in Alaska, but at that point in time, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do something else because I still hadn't figured out what I originally set out to do when I was 18 and went to college to study fisheries. So I took a chance. I got my captain's license and I started working at a fly out lodge in Alaska. Four and a half months of fishing and guiding with no days off. No sleeping in, no families, just fishing. And it was wild. I've chased off tons of Alaskan brown bears. Um, I've been in a float plane five different times where the motors shut down, um, jet boating up rivers, watching millions of salmon run up into Bristol Bay, catching 30 plus inch wild rainbow trout. And although I took a break from my degree and studying in college, technically, at least as far as my parents concerned, since I was still fishing, I was using my degree. And then it was my second year up in Alaska when I got a new job opportunity. Um, when you guide in the summertime, it's only four and a half months out of the year. Throughout the rest of the year, if you don't have a job as a guide, what do you do? And I got offered a job to work for the fly fishing film tour. I immediately said yes, because 
our job was to travel to 47 different theaters across the entire country and to put on these awesome fly fishing film tour events. Sometimes up to a thousand people will be in a venue. And so it's this collective gathering place where everyone comes together just to get excited about fishing. And one of the other perks about working for the fly fishing film tour was that as we traveled from venue to venue all across the country, we would go fishing with the local fly shops that helped sold our tickets. We'd go meet up with sponsors. And since being a part of the fly fishing film tour, I've got a chance to fish in the Olympic Peninsula for steelhead, uh, for striped bass in the Sacramento River Delta in California, the Missouri River in Montana, fishing for redfish down in Texas, Chad in South Carolina, and for salmon and steelhead up in the Great Lake tributaries. And that was really awesome, but the coolest part about the fly fishing film tour, I learned that through all of my studies, all of my teachings, all of these different travels, that not everybody agrees on the same things, and especially when it comes to conservation. But the fly fishing film tour is super unique because when everybody comes to this theater, people with different beliefs, different interests, they come to celebrate conservation and just to get really excited about fishing. And I recognize that film is like this very powerful way to share super meaningful stories, powerful conservation narratives added with incredible fishing and cool music is something that just gets people super excited and willing to focus and listen to some of the more complex challenges that our cold water fisheries face across the board, not only in the US, but around the entire world. And so over the last two years, I've helped direct and produce a handful of different films. Um, we work with film directors and producers all across the entire world. And the coolest part about it is that we can find authentic stories that can change the way people think. And those perspectives on conservation can be taught about or shown through film in so many different ways. It's just a really incredible tool to make a difference, to help protect some of these places we really love. So besides giving you guys a huge rundown on how crazy my life has been as I've gone from place to place, the biggest takeaway is especially being in high school like most of you guys are right now, you don't need to have everything figured out. I set out to study fisheries when I was 18 years old and my life went literally a million different directions before I found something that I truly wanted to do for the rest of my life. So you guys can have a million different passions. You can have a million different interests. At the end of the day, if you try your best and you follow what you love, I can guarantee you, you won't be disappointed with what you learn, the friendships you make, and you have a really good chance of changing people's minds and changing the world to be a better place. And so that being said, like I mentioned in the very beginning, I'd love to hear any questions you guys have. I have a list of different interesting summer internships, teaching opportunities, potential guide opportunities as well. So if that's something that you might be interested in doing in the future, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd love to connect you guys with those opportunities. And as far as the fly fishing film tour is concerned, if you guys have any cool pictures of you guys going fishing, or if you're interested in making a film for next year's tour, or just for our Instagram and Facebook. It's a serious challenge. I want you guys to, to take me up on that and, uh, and show me what you got. Do you guys have any questions? I have a question. So when everybody tours, do you actually like go from city to city touring with them or are you just kind of like behind the scenes and you help like make the videos? Honestly, I do a little bit of everything. So this last year, um, I made a film that was in the 2020 Fly Fishing Film Tour. Um, I also organized the entire tour. I helped take 120 different film submissions, choose 11 of them, and make sure that they were the right distance. And then once all that happened, I got some friends together and hired them on board. And then I traveled all around the entire country putting on these shows. So... I do a little bit of everything. That's cool. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work too. It follows you to bounce around doing a lot of different things and gaining a lot of experience. 
would it be fair to say that you took advantage of where you were at the time and learned everything you could at that point before you, you know, not knowing where you were going to go later? Absolutely. When I, when I went to school in Montana, a lot of my friends were, I don't want to say posh, pinky to the, you know, pinky up. But when they heard that I was going to go teach in Wisconsin for a bit at a, a school for conservation that teaches kids that are in high school called Conserve School, um, they were like, you're going to go to the flatland? Like, why would you ever leave Montana? And I was like, well, I have an incredible opportunity to spend in a whole semester with students teaching, learning, and spending time outdoors. And I recognized that even if it wasn't really what I set out to be or set out to do, I was going to learn something very unique and very different. And I was going to be able to go fish some new places I hadn't been before. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, is, is anyone interested in submitting some films for next year's tour? I guess I am. <laughs> so, um, Paul, uh, one of our do-it-yourself activities for this session is actually a video, a fishing video challenge on TikTok. So we can collect those <laughs> videos and um, get them all to you. Yeah, and I'm not joking when I say year-round, every year moving yeah. to the future. Um, Larry, feel free to share my work and personal email with all the students. If you guys have any videos authentically, you guys going out fishing, having that awesome moment or learning something, um, send it our way. I'd love to post it. I'm sure that the people that follow the fly fishing Instagram and Facebook would love it. We have mm -hmm. a lot of followers and um, we just like to post videos and pictures of people having a good time. So especially if, if you guys are going out there, putting the effort in, we'd love to, we'd love to share it. I'd like to share that, you know, in the past with the film tour, one of the problems is the tour is really about the sponsors, right? And highlighting their sponsorship is really important to the tour. So sometimes it was difficult to get things, um, you know, submitted that could be shown at the live shows. However, with the advent of the Facebook page and all the following that goes on, we have really good opportunities for that stuff to be shared and viewed, uh, even though it may not be live in the show. Typically at the shows, they have an intermission where local TU chapters and other conservation groups get to speak about their passions mm -hmm. and what they're doing. And the film tour is one of the greatest um, advocates for uh, uh, TU and conservation that we have. And thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. We really appreciate it um, coming welcome, and visiting. Guys. And I'll show you guys when I share again the cameo page we made up for Paul with information about Paul and we'll add his email to it too. <laughs> so. And just, I got one last point is uh, one thing I've been contemplating for this next year's fly fishing film tour is adding at, at the very least a small section for, for young filmmakers for the intermission part. So short films between three to six minutes might be able to play during intermission. Um, I've had a chance to bring it up with a couple people. Uh, you would be one of those first groups. So if anybody feels compelled to go out there and try to make a short film, um, once again, Larry, share their email with me and uh, let's see if we can't make something like that happen. That'd be great. We have That'd at least really four cool. or five uh, former students who are actually uh, you know, doing things like this in of... you know, smaller venues. So I'm sure they'd love to do that. Awesome, awesome. Cool, excellent. All right, did we have a short clip to look at, Annie? Did, would you like me to share the uh, F3T uh, 2020 stoke reel? Would that be good timing for that? Yeah. All right. All right, let me know if you can hear your sound, if everyone can mute their mics. Um, we will be playing audio through the computer. At that moment, I realized what was possible for the very, very first time in my life. I had never seen anyone do that with a rod or anything else. And I, I said, whatever this man has, I've got to get there. Let's go. 
his template for the rest of us is to try to remain vital for as long as you can. At this point in my life, all I have is time. All right, thank you. I really appreciate that that started and ended with Flip Pallop. He's one of my <laughs> heroes. And um, what that man has to say about living your life and being taking the steps to do the things that you want to do and be uh, a person of consequence by making small motions. He's a tremendous man. So I really appreciate that. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, guys. I got a role here. Um, I'd love to. I'll be part of these sessions in the future. We got a little bit longer. Love, I got to jump on another one. But it was great to meet all you. you guys. Thanks for being a part of this event. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Paul. Thank you. All right. All right. So hopefully everybody enjoyed that. Those films always get people worked up and ready to rock and roll. <laughs> excited about, as Paul said, excited about fishing and excited about the environment. So uh, our next guest this morning, so we, today is a day of guests. Uh, our next guest this morning is Dan Brow. Dan's been waiting patiently, thank you so much, through the whole session so far this morning, following along with us. Uh, and Dan is a aquatic biologist. He also works for Colorado Parks and Wildlife in Gunnison. And Dan is involved in all kinds of fisheries management in Colorado, um, in the Gunnison district. Um, and last year, uh, at our life camp, Dan made, prepared a really nice program about uh, cutthroat conservation, tying together a lot of the, the past and the present and the research and the future plans for restoration going on in the state. And it was absolutely fascinating. And this is a great opportunity to learn about our native fishes and some of the uh, some of the non-natives too, and trout management in our state of Colorado. So I'm going to pass uh, the floor over to Dan. We welcome you, Dan, and we're really pleased that you're here. And um, don't hesitate to ask Dan questions um, as he's going through his uh, presentation. All right, thanks, Barbara. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, great to be with you guys today. And uh, it sounds pretty amazing, the work that Paul's done with the film tour. I know I've attended a couple of the film tours and really appreciate the local get together and the opportunities to raise money for some of the conservation projects that we have going on. And uh, myself, uh, early on, I was interested in fisheries as well. And I uh, grew up in Meeker, Colorado, which is in Northwest Colorado. And really was interested in, in hunting and fishing. Um, spent a lot of time with my dad hunting and fishing. And so when I was trying to think of what I wanted to do as a career, uh, I really thought it would be interesting to be able to work out in the outdoors and uh, really started thinking more about being a biologist or working in biology uh, with a high school biology class that really included a strong field component where we'd go out and uh, do field work uh, and uh, really gave me a taste of the work that I continue to do today and um, got me interested in fisheries and wildlife biology. So uh, from high school, went to Colorado State University up in Fort Collins and uh, studied wildlife and fisheries biology prior to starting with uh, Division of Wildlife at the time, now Parks and Wildlife as a fish culturist first and then uh, as a wildlife or a fisheries biologist, which is a position I've had uh, since about 97. So uh, happy to talk with you guys about cutthroat trout today. And uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please, um, please ask questions. Um, I'll try to uh, go through and talk a little bit about the history. Um, maybe we'll go ahead and get the presentation going here and uh, really try to talk about cutthroat trout from a historical perspective. All right. 
All right, can everybody see the uh, presentation slide? Yes. Okay, great. So as I mentioned, I've really wanted to, I've, I've always been interested, uh, be, besides being interested in Dan, fisheries, I have been. Sorry, Dan, yeah. we're, we're seeing your, in, um, we're seeing the desktop, not the presentation. So we see, okay. we see the PowerPoint in the um, edit mode. Okay. Let's see. Let me see if I can just. Like, if you um, go to presentation mode and then share the screen with the presentation mode, that usually works. OK. Sounds good. Now let me start the presentation again. <laughs> OK. There. Is that perfect. working? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Great. And uh, yeah, so really have been interested in, in fisheries, but also in the history of Colorado. Growing up in Colorado, always enjoyed Colorado history. And so it was neat to look at cutthroat trout from more of a historical perspective and really helps us to see and uh, be able to explain why we have uh, the trout species we have out on the landscape today by looking at what's happened historically. And so we put this presentation together with the assistance of Kevin Rogers, who is a uh, uh, cutthroat researcher also working with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And so the main things I'm going to talk today um, are influences on cutthroat trout um, through uh, mining that was a very significant uh, thing that occurred in Colorado in the late 1800s. Uh, then we'll talk about how fish culture has uh, really uh, resulted in a significantly different distribution of fish species today. And then talk about conservation efforts moving forward to, to restore and to ensure that cutthroat trout are available on into the future. Uh, so just looking at, at our early mining history, uh, the first mining known to have occur in Colorado, really interest began in the 1760s when uh, Spanish explorers, particularly Juan Maria de Rivera discovered gold or silver, it's not known for sure, um, at present day Silverton. Um, and during the 1700s, there was additional activity uh, with fur trapping, but it was fairly small and inconsequential until um, the mining interests really brought a lot of people to the state of Colorado. Uh, and that, that interest really began with the Pikes Peak Gold Rush in 1858. In my area, in the Gunnison Basin, uh, there was really more limited activity until just a little bit later, around the 1860s. But just a few pictures. It, it was amazing to me how quick development occurred. Um, this is a slide that showed uh, Lake City, which is in the upper Gunnison, upper Lake Fork drainage. Um, and this picture was from 1877 to 1879. So within just a few years, there was a lot of development that had occurred related to mining. Dan, one other question, sorry. Um, do you have something on your on the right-hand side of your screen over the um, slide deck, maybe the pictures of the uh, participants or? So you're seeing something other than just the presentation? Well, I see something that's blacked out. The right-hand side is blacked out. It, um, do you have like the participants uh, view or something that you want need to minimize? The thumbnail view so, of the videos or the? So do you see the text titles on the right side of the, the picture? No. They're, they're getting cut off, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it looks like you might have the participant view um, overlaying it or something. Hmm. Yeah, so what's on, on the presentation on the right side of the picture of Lake City is just some text that uh, right. says, uh, kind of describes when the rush began and some okay. other information. Are you able to see that? Um, it looks like there's something over it. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. It's cut off. Let's see. Let me end that. I'm sorry. And see if we can. <laughs> well, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. This. See, see, I think. But I, like, I'm I wondering. I try to share. Go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering if you have the manage the participant 
um, view from the Zoom might be covering it. Okay. Yeah, I don't have that view oh, on okay. my. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Zoom let's, screen. I'm sorry. Let, let's try again. Okay. Um, so let me. I can try to share my other screen, and we yeah, can that, see how. That'll that be works. fine too. Okay. Yeah, that works too. Of course. Let's see. And if I change monitors, okay. There, that's perfect. Good. That's it, that's better. Uh, yep. Okay. Great. There. Um, there we go. And I guess I guess on timing, are we? We're do, doing good. Yeah, okay. like um. Yeah, we're doing good. Um, if we could wrap up around 11.45, that would be awesome, or before that. Okay, sounds great. So you can, can you see the whole slide yes. now? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so um, the it's it's interesting in, in much of Colorado, there was a lot of uh, Indian activity and it really affected development and, and people come to the Gunnison area. And so another important factor was a treaty that really, um, resulting in a lot of the Utes departing the Gunnison area and really opened it up to further mining and development uh, in 1873. But that that mining activity was really significant out on the landscape uh, with uh, significant placer mining going on, which as you can see in this picture, had a major impact on streams and, uh, and drainages. Uh, additional mining activity included hard rock mining where uh, ore was brought out of the ground um, and into and milled in many locations, uh, creating further impacts on the landscape. Uh, this picture from about 1908. Um, and in, in my area, in the Gunston area, we had a lot of folks moving to our area around 1879. And we had several times uh, more people during that time that lived in our area than what we have today, just because of all the mining interest. But how did mining impact fisheries? Um, as you can see from those pictures, it had a major impact on habitat. Um, many of those impacts were localized, however, in, in, into the drainage where the mining occurred and then downstream. Um, but there were many other areas where fisheries were impacted and it was really centered around collection of fish for food. Um, early on, Fish were collected by the use of dynamite, traps, set lines, which would be a line with many hooks on the line, seines, and fishing. And this picture on the right shows Savoya Creek, which is actually covered by, or this is the Gunnison River near Savoya Creek um, on a section uh, that's now covered by Blue Mesa. Uh, but fishermen, uh, folks that were catching fish for food often targeted spawning runs and that really decimated the reproductive capacity of these streams that were being impacted. And many of these fish uh, were also collected and sold at market to, to feed miners in, in our communities. So early on, uh, regulations were put into place even before Colorado was a state. Um, these were put in place by the Colorado Territorial Assembly. Um, starting in 1861, it made it illegal to take fish by saying net, basket or trap. In 1870, you couldn't, you were outlawed from using explosives or poison to collect fish. And then in 1872, uh, it was required that if you were fishing uh, for fish, other than working for a hatchery, you had to catch with a hook and line. So those regulations were really early and, uh, and interesting. But by 1880, a lot of our local fisheries were severely impacted. And this quote from the 1880 Field and Stream uh, really showed that in much of Colorado, <clears throat> our fisheries were severely depleted. And it was noted that happened a lot quicker than similar depletions in other wildlife that were used for food. So uh, there was a state and federal response in it. It began with the hiring of the first U.S. Fish Commissioner in 1871, but it's kind of interesting to get his views on what to do about this. He really felt like it was better to spend money to raise fish and stock them throughout the landscape 
so that people would have fish to feed, to, to eat, rather than trying to protect the fish that were left. So um, really started up a big effort to restock much of the state. Uh, and then in 1877, uh, the state hired their first fish commissioner to work on similar things. And so the age of fish culture in Colorado really started and um, people's interest in raising fish likely did occur even before mining uh, really was big in Colorado, but it really accelerated after uh, mining and uh, utilization of fish in streams uh, depleted local fisheries. I um, mean, uh, early on, the fish that were available for raising in hatcheries were primarily cutthroat trout. And that was because it was awful hard to get other species of fish to our area until railroads reached Colorado in 1869. And in, in my area here in Gunnison, railroads reached Gunnison in 1881. So uh, railroads uh, really did help facilitate uh, us being able to bring, or the people at that time being able to bring uh, fish species to Colorado. Uh, there was a lot of interest in raising fish uh, with, and uh, in 1874, the Fish Breeders Association was formed in Denver. The same year, an article uh, was in Harper's Weekly uh, showing uh, some of the techniques used to raise fish in Colorado. So again, this was really early on. Um, uh, and uh, uh, during that time period when a lot of development was going on in Colorado. So uh, fish culture and uh, fish hatcheries uh, were significantly developed beginning about in the 1880s. And uh, many of the early hatcheries were private hatcheries um, developed by private individuals and sportsmen's groups. Uh, but they often worked with uh, the early federal and state officials um, and then later with state and federal hatcheries. Um, so from 1885 to 1915, 25 state hatcheries were built. Um, and the federal hatchery was built at Leadville in 1888. So and Barbara, if you don't mind, just uh, if, if, you're in, if anybody does have questions, I, I don't know that I'm able to see those. So let me know okay. if there are any. Um, so just some of the other species that you may uh, find in Colorado if you're out fishing, um, kind of go through those here briefly. Uh, brook trout were imported beginning in 1872, and they're from the East Coast, and they really uh, do compete with cutthroat trout very significantly, especially in our, in our high elevation streams. Uh, they tend to have a reproductive and a fry size advantage just due to the fact that they spawn in the fall while cutthroat trout spawn in the spring. So it does seem to give brook trout an advantage in many of our small streams. Um, an interesting species was introduced about that time. Chinook salmon were introduced from California, uh, but this is a species we really don't continue to have in Colorado, but was, it was one that was imported early on. Rainbow trout were also imported from the West Coast in 1882. And uh, one of the things of note about rainbow trout is they'll readily hybridize with cutthroat trout. So it really adds to our conservation challenge if rainbow trout are in the system because it's difficult to maintain pure cutthroat trout. Brown trout were introduced in 1885. And of course they came from Europe, uh, but were imported uh, from England originally um, by uh, General John Pierce in Denver. Um, and they certainly have taken very well to many of our larger streams. And uh, so have really helped to displace cutthroat trout early on in our larger streams along with rainbow trout. And uh, so we really don't have many cutthroat trout in our larger river systems because brown trout and rainbow trout really took over those habitats. And uh, of note, uh, the question did come up earlier on cutthroat trout and how large they can grow. A lot of it is uh, relative to their habitat. So before brown trout and rainbow trout were in our larger rivers, we did see quite a few cutthroat trout that would get to a very large size um, in that high quality, larger stream habitat. Um, lake trout were introduced in 1879 and they really function well in large reservoirs, which were not very pre prevalent in Colorado 
prior to our large reservoirs getting built. So don't really have as much of an impact to cutthroat trout. So looking at cutthroat trout though, we in Colorado, we do have three subspecies of cutthroat trout. And I think these were mentioned earlier, uh, Colorado River cutthroat trout, greenback cutthroat trout, and Rio Grande cutthroat trout. But we certainly know much more uh, about cutthroat today due to a lot of the science that's gone on. And I'll talk about some of that. So we really did see all these different types of cutthroats across the landscape. And uh, Aya, you, or I'm sorry, Aisha, you had asked how to tell the difference. And um, we often would look at spotting patterns, coloration, and uh, cut the cut markings on fish to try to distinguish between our subspecies. And we did find that to be fairly difficult early on. So we, as genetic tests became avail available, we really tried to utilize genetic methods to tell the difference between our subspecies. So in 2007, one of the earlier studies, I uh, looked at those three subspecies that we knew were present in Colorado and tried to differentiate what subspecies each of our population was based on their genetic makeup. Well, what we found um, is that this study was able to tell the difference by using microsatellite and AFLP genetic techniques to differentiate our different populations. The problem though, is that five of the nine populations on the East Slope that were thought to be greenback populations were actually blue lineage Colorado River cutthroat trout. And four populations on the East Slope were identified as green lineage populations. Uh, however, there was one population on the West Slope that was also identified as a green lineage population. So it really didn't fit our description of our subspecies based on geography and uh, certainly led to many questions. So one of the things that that study also showed us in this chart, hopefully you can see uh, that the red lines joining populations note the relatedness of those two populations. And so you can see that there were East Slope and West Slope populations that were nearly identical or that were very similar. And they were across throughout the state in a pattern that you wouldn't expect to see because generally with cutthroat lineages, you'd expect the, their similarity to be, to be based on the basin that they're in, uh, not related to populations clear across the state. So, the outcome of this study basically concluded that we were managing with the wrong species and uh, there was quite a media play on this uh, that was throughout the world. Uh, there were articles on how we were using the wrong fish for restoration. So the greenback cut throughout recovery team, they were actually uh, trying to delist greenbacks uh, within the state and with the results of this study, it really set that effort back. Uh, so in trying to, to explain why we saw that pattern, we really wanted to go back in time to look at the source of cutthroat trout within Colorado. And uh, so this is a picture of Trapper's Lake, which was uh, one of the primary sources of cutthroat trout that were used in stocking throughout the state of Colorado. So this slide shows where fish were stocked from Trapper's Lake throughout the state. And as you can see, Trapper's Lake cutthroat were stocked into almost every county that had cold water habitats in the state. And uh, during 1889 to, uh, or 1914 to 1925, 26 million cutthroat were stocked out of Trapper's Lake throughout the state. So kind of going back to uh, the CU study from 2007, we also saw this population of green lineage fish on the West Slope. And uh, so really wanted to look into that closer. And so first off, we didn't look at many of our populations on the West Slope. So our first question was to look across all of our known cutthroat populations 
in the Gunnison uh, in Colorado and uh, Dolores Basins. And what we found is that that single population identified in 2007 wasn't at all unique. In fact, most of our populations that we thought were endemic or original uh, populations of cutthroat trout that were continuing to exist in those basins were actually the green lineage cutthroat trout. So it really changed our view and asked further questions that uh, we wanted to take a closer look at. So this slide shows all of the populations of cutthroat trout on the west slope that were now identified as green lineage populations that would go with that single one that was identified in the 2007 study. So, uh, so th then the question of how did the green lineage populations get to the east slope? Uh, and we can go back and look at what the source of green, these green lineage cutthroats was. Uh, and this takes us to the Grand Mesa uh, fishery and the field hatchery up on Grand Mesa. So this hatchery um, was really active early on and provided uh, black spotted trout eggs to quite a few hatcheries throughout Colorado and uh, the West. And uh, from the Grand Mesa field hatchery, 29 million fish were stocked from 1880 or 1899 to 1909. So in a similar pattern to Trapper's Lake, we've scattered these green lineage fish throughout almost every cold water county uh, in Colorado. And so then to really get a better idea of what we have on the landscape today, we came up with the idea of looking at early museum specimens that were collected, some of which were collected before we really were scattering fish throughout the state. Uh, this included uh, an early study as early as 1856. Um, and uh, one of the things that's really interesting is one of the the collectors, David Starr Jordan in 1889, he was already talking about how fish had been stocked all over the state from various sources by that time and was questioning his ability to be able to get good samples. Uh, but from these collections, we, were, we really felt like these collections should be a lot closer to what was originally, uh, what populations were originally in these drainages than what we have today. And so by going back and looking at those museum specimens and taking small tissue samples and using more modern genetic techniques, we were able to get a better insight into what cutthroats we had in our drain drainages originally. So this study was also done by Dr. Metcalf at CU and uh, looked at these historical um, collections. And this told a much different story and really fit much closer with what we'd expect to see throughout the state. And it identified six distinct lineages of cutthroat, stout, cutthroat trout within the state of Colorado. And uh, we followed that up with a study that looked at what fish look like and looked at spotting patterns and other physical characters to try to see if we could differentiate these subspecies. And now that we could tell the difference genetically and separate those out, we were then able to better identify physical differences between the subspecies and did find that we were able to separate them out. So once we could know what populations were actually from which lineage, it made the job of separating them out, looking at their physical character characteristics a lot easier. So the lineages we have now, um, that were identified with that study include the blue lineage population. Um, and this is native to the Yampa and white. And uh, I would wanna note that at this time, we still are managing the blue green lineage and the San Juan River cutthroats as Colorado River cutthroat trout. But it's yet to be decided whether they'll be designated as new subspecies or not, if they'll be managed as just genetic variation within Colorado River cutthroat trout. Uh, blue lineage fish have been stocked, as we talked about from Trapper's Lake across the state. So we do have conservation populations um, throughout 
several different uh, drainages within Colorado. Uh, we do have 300 conservation populations of blue lineage cutthroat trout. Dan, can you quickly talk about how you separate and uh, maintain uh, those uh, protected lineages? Sure. Quickly... So, um, so there's a couple different ways. Um, so we certainly will manage wild populations out on on uh, the landscape, and so that's probably the number one way that we maintain these lineages is that when you have pure fish out on the landscape, you maintain that. Uh, you ensure that you're not stocking other fish on top of them. And we often use those as a source of eggs to restock into other waters. Uh, we also do develop hatchery brood stocks. Um, and so we're able to utilize those hatchery brood stocks to maintain that genetic variation too. Did, did that answer your question? Well, but specifically we're using physical barriers to isolate them from other uh, predatory uh, species, correct? Yeah, so quite often our cutthroat populations are relegated to headwater streams. And uh, when we have non-native fish present with them, we have issues with hybridization with rainbow trout and with displacement with brook trout, um, rainbow and uh, brown trout. So we often do depend on physical barriers at the downstream reach of our cutthroat populations to keep them separate from non-native fish. And that does mean help maintain their genetic integrity too. Uh, so our green lineage fish, uh, uh, this slide back to that really does show both our blue lineage and our green lineage cutthroats um, today. And as you can see in the upper Colorado, Gunnison and Dolores basins, we do have quite a few blue lineage populations and many of those were restored through conservation efforts over the last 40 or 50 years. So green, green lineage populations, um, again, since we stocked those out of the Grand Mesa field hatchery, uh, they are found on both sides of the divide. Um, and we currently have about 60 conservation populations of green lineage Colorado River cutthroat trout. Uh, Rio Grande cutthroat trout have always broken, they've been easier to identify um, just looking at them. And so uh, we did find that populations that were managed as Rio Grande cutthroat trout were true Rio Grands. And so not much has changed there. And there are currently 120 conservation populations. Our greenback cutthroat trout have seen quite a bit of change in, in what we know about greenbacks. As I mentioned, all nine of the populations early on that were thought to be greenback populations were found to be either green lineage or Colorado River blue lineage populations. However, there was one population on in Bear Creek uh, that were an, a population that was established on Pikes Peak that had maintained that subspecies. And so with the newer genetic information, we were able to, uh, we were able to identify that. Um, it was a known population early on, but because it was so uniquely different looking than a lot of the populations that were thought to be greenback, it wasn't used for brood stocks. Uh, but now we know that is the one, that was one of the uh, remaining greenback, true greenback populations. So we've really gone to work in um, bringing that population into our hatcheries and using it for restocking on the east slope. And that is out of my area of management, but uh, certainly uh, a lot of work's been done there that I haven't been directly uh, working with. Um, so here's a picture of one of those Bear Creek cutthroats and then some pictures of Bear Creek um, where that population was maintained due to the present of presence of a natural barrier. Uh, whoops. So um, certainly better news this time with the new newer science that's directing our cutthroat trout management. And uh, we're in much better shape to uh, be able to be, in this case, restocking those Bear Creek cutthroats into new habitats and to continue work on uh, greenback recovery. Uh, the other populations, uh, the other subspecies of 
cutthroat that we did have in the state are yellowfin cutthroat trout. And as we discussed earlier, they are thought to be extinct and they were native to the Arkansas River drainage. Uh, the last one was one that was more recently identified through that recent work um, and is a San, San Juan cutthroat trout. Uh, they are found in several streams and will be continuing to work to expand their numbers. But really the, the, uh, uh, the overarching uh, idea in cutthroat trout management is really to keep all the parts. And Aldo Leopold really said it the best, you know, you really want to keep every cog and wheel um, if we're out there working with cutthroat trout. Um, so here's what we have today um, with our existing five lineages of cutthroat trout within Colorado. And as you can see, uh, they are the, the species they're most closely related to is rainbow trout, but they're fairly distantly related, but close enough that they can still hybridize. So uh, Barbara, how are we doing on time? We're doing good. We okay. definitely have time for questions. Okay, I'll, I, the last slides I had is just to talk about what we're doing today. And so yeah, maybe- please real do, quickly, please do. Um, we, we're certainly working to um, take existing populations, uh, spawn them out in the wild and bring those into our hatcheries. We are real active at, you know, paying attention to what's going on on the landscape. And in the case of fires, we've had to rescue several populations to ensure they didn't blink out after fires. Uh, fires are really tough on fish within drainages and ca can cause them to be entirely wiped out. So uh, we have gone in in those situations and rescued fish and brought them into our hatcheries. Uh, we do a lot of habitat work to try to improve habitat condition, conditions for cutthroat trout. And uh, for our restoration work, we're really spending a lot of time going out and looking for uh, new populations and also assessing to, to see what streams we may want to restore. Uh, we are using eDNA to look at particularly brook trout presence within streams that we may want to reclaim for cutthroat trout and then uh, do undertake projects that remove brook trout from our streams and uh, allow us to restock cutthroat trout. So this slide just shows uh, the green is actually a non-toxic dye that allows us to see what water we've treated when we're applying rotenone to remove brook trout. And we use uh, potassium permanganate to detoxify the treated reach at the bottom of the reach to allow us to restock cutthroat trout. We've really found unless we remove all of the non-native species, we often see uh, that cutthroat, cutthroat trout have difficulty in persisting. So some more pictures of one of our uh, reclamation projects. So, and then we've followed that up by restocking pure fish. And uh, so uh, try to be active in all these fronts to increase the number of streams the cutthroat streams that we have out there on the landscape to ensure long-term persistence. So, and that is all I had prepared. Um, what questions do we have out there? I have a question. Um, okay. You said how like the rainbow trout, they grow and they hatch a lot easier than like the cutthroat. Like what's the reasoning behind that? Probably the biggest reason is just the number of years that they've been in hatchery situations. Um, so they've really um, uh, adjusted to hatchery living. You know, living in a hatchery is a lot different than living out in a natural stream. So um, over 150 years probably or 130 years of raising rainbow trout in hatcheries and having hatchery brood stocks, they've become – less wild and, and more uh, able to do well in that hatchery environment. Good question. <laughs> Does anyone know where rainbow trout uh, originally are native to? Any guesses? Is it California? Yep, California. The McCloyd, McLeod, McCloyd River? McLeod, yeah. McLeod, McLeod. River. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Other hey. questions for Dan? 
This and maybe is, just, the, yeah, I was just going to say the flip side of that, you know, cutthroat trout are just hard to raise in hatcheries because they are wild. They're not used to feeding on pelleted feed and, you know, living in raceways. So um, it does take quite a bit of an adjustment to, for our hatchery folks to learn how to get cutthroats on feed and, and how to raise them. So they are a lot more challenging, but our, our fish culture folks have done a great job to, to uh, figure out many of those questions and to allow us to, to raise fish in our hatcheries. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Uh, historically, um, you know, raising fish is nothing new. It started in Europe with the Browns. It took a while for the Browns to, you know, migrated here, but all the way back to the days of day, uh, George Washington, they were trying to rear brook trout in hatcheries, but they're so much more, um, Oh, akin, akin to um, uh, water quality and temperature and being able to uh, raise them was much more difficult. And the same things were tried here in Colorado, Wyoming, and where native, uh, you know, cutthroats are at. They too were a little bit wild and they had difficulties uh, rearing them. They went out to California and found this red side fish that uh, they didn't know what to do with. And somehow or another, it seemed to like to, uh, you know, breed in captivity. So it took off from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Very, very cool. Um, well, let's give Dan and all of our guests a round of applause and thanks for sharing this information with us today. That's great. So today, you know, you've seen, uh, we've gone from, you know, Dan really clearly showed us the relationship between at least the historical distribution of our species, uh, our, our native cutthroat species, and what, what we talked about last session, our watershed basins, and they form natural divides. And then, yeah, I think what we can get the most out of you know, our speakers today really is how large the human factor um, has weighed on um, the good and the bad that's been happening. Um, you know, early on, uh, we were hungry, we needed to eat, we depleted our fisheries. Um, we saw that as a problem. One of the first laws ever passed in uh, territorial Colorado was to protect fish. That's pretty cool. The beginning of conservation um, goes all the way back to territorial days. Uh, and um, we've introduced all these non-native species that as anglers, we all depend on uh, and we get a lot of uh, uh, amusement uh, from going and catching our, our non-native species, but it's something special to go and uh, catch a native cutthroat too. Uh, and um, as we have evolved uh, in our science now, our scientists are using a combination of historical sleuthing uh, to figure out how we have this mix of distributions and the science of DNA, which wasn't possible you know, 20 years ago um, to understand our subspecies, how they're related to each other and how to better protect them. So I think we've had a really interesting series of speakers today uh, and uh, Paul Nicoletti was a great uh, motivational speaker too. Uh, already some of you are uh, sending in your, uh, your videos. How cool is that? So just kind of stick with us a couple minutes to wrap up here today. Um, uh, next session, session four um, is, going to, is our macroinvertebrates and fly selection is going to be the topic on the next session. So take a look at the Google sites. You'll see the outline for what we're going to do on that session. Um, prior to the session, please review this uh, handout, macroinvertebrates. Um, this is a good introduction uh, to and prepare you for what we're gonna talk about and do next time. Uh, and here's some questions you can answer 
um, about macroinvertebrates too and what you get out of this handout. Um, so that's one thing we'd like you to do to prepare for the next session. Uh, and we're gonna play an insect identification game. So you definitely wanna re review that handout. Uh, and Dick's putting together a whole series of photos and we're gonna see who does best at identifying some of these insects. Uh, and then we're gonna also cover matching what we learn about the macroinvertebrates, using what we learn about macroinvertebrates in a stream location to help us with fly selection. So we have a nice connection um, to uh, fly fishing on that also. Um, so for this session, um, some of the do-it-yourself activities Continue to do your stream walks and scavenger hunt work. You can do any of the activities from the previous sessions that you might not have done yet. And then we've put together four um, new ones. So I alluded to one. So Paul challenged you to uh, take some short video. Um, we have a TikTok fishing challenge to make a fishing video. So we'll combine those two. Um, and you can post your video to TikTok and tag us. Um, if you don't do social media, um, use this form down here at the bottom to upload, submit your um, video and upload it. And I'll make a page like I did for um, the other submissions from last session, like for the art submission and the photographs. So, uh, and then we have another, uh, and well, and again, the best submission there will earn a prize. Um, and then we have another art challenge. You can tell we like art challenge. This time it's a cutthroat art challenge. We have all this variation in our native cutthroats. Uh, and how does that inspire you? Uh, and to uh, capture that beauty and the wonder of cutthroats. So um, you can do the cutthroat art challenge um, we haven't talked about um, fish handling principles that much, but here's an opportunity for you to dive in and learn about fish handling uh, principles. So um, there's an organization, a, a nonprofit organization called Keep Fish Wet. Um, go and study their principles uh, and some of their tips and, and uh, particularly for fish uh, photography. If you use them uh, to do like a keep fish wet kind of photo, you can do a posting or you can also upload it and we'll post it onto the site page, which is We lost Barbara. Yeah, I lost audio. Okay. <laughs> um, trying to see if she's popping back in. Oof. Trevor. Are you tying? No. No. I'm responding to my mom who asked if I wanted for lunch. Oh. I wish I was tying. <laughs> Good. Well, lunch is more important right now, I think. I'm feeling it too. I think fly tying is more important. Yeah. Yeah, Trevor, you should come over tonight. We're going to tie some flies. I think I should. I was sharing with Noah my uh, my killer uh, Alaskan uh, mouse. Um, it uh, is has a rabbit fur, you know, strips as its uh, main ingredient, but they usually uh, sink. But I have uh, specially designed this one where it floats all day. So. Um, you know, I'll, I'll share some uh, progressive pictures of how that comes together.
muted. Uh, speaking of cutthroats, I'm going to go up to Rocky Mountain National Park uh, this afternoon and try and catch a few. So uh, I'll report back next uh, next week on how we did. Over the weekend, I'm going to go try to uh, catch a cutthroat up near Fourth of July Trailhead. Great. Yeah. Was was that you, Noah? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Try the uh, portal area that I talked to about as well, because there's some nice nice ones up there as well. Would you mind uh, sending like a Google Maps to that or? Um, yeah, it's pretty simple. You go to uh, on um, the peak to peak to um, the uh, the town of okay, Dick. What is it? Um, uh, Rollinsville, uh, Moffitt, and you turn right and follow the road to the tunnel uh, tunnel portal, and you can find oh, it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, along South Boulder Creek. Yeah, going above. Uh, yeah, you know, above Rollinsville. The portal. Yeah. That is a very good place to catch cutthroats. I've caught a lot up there. Yeah, and don't be afraid to fish. You know the areas on the way. There's national forest um, uh, property that's open that uh, we did some habitat work on, as well as just below the uh, the portal as well. So very mm -hmm. good fishing up there. It doesn't get a lot of pressure. Right. Okay. It looks like Barbara's back with us. I think I just saw her. She she was coming back in. Are you back, Barbara? Well, while we're waiting for Barb to come back, I'll make a couple of announcements. Remember tonight, seven o'clock, we have the watershed um, uh, deep dive. I promise not to be boring. I really want to have a lot of questions that you have about watersheds and be able to answer your questions and go through it in a manner that you know makes you feel more comfortable and uh, give you more knowledge. And then again, we'll also have the uh, uh, watch party tomorrow night at 7 p.m. We'll have film from uh, R.A. Biotti, from uh, Paul, from uh, also uh, uh, Craig Matthews and uh, probably a former student or two, if we can. It'll be an hour to 15 minutes or so at longest for the actual film activity. Hey, sorry, my, my uh, internet crashed and I lost everything, <laughs> but I got back in on my phone. So thank you, Larry, for yeah. finishing that up. Um, Continue, continue on with your do-it-yourself activities. I went and picked up all the rod packages um, last week and I have them in my spare bedroom. Uh, you guys are doing a great job participating and we really appreciate it. And go on to the Google site and look at the things that your peers are submitting. Uh, learn about your peers. Um, look at their story of my life story, um, stories, and um, some of these people live near you. They're, it's an opportunity to make new connections and find new people to go out and enjoy this wonderful sport of fly fishing and being outdoors in this great place that we live in. Um, so I hope you can join Larry tonight and uh, hope to also see you at the watch party. Barb, before we break off, how are our campers doing earning gadgets for their lanyards? They're all doing really awesome. Good. Lots of people have been um, submitting the do it their self activities. So you're all keeping track. You're keeping on track, that's for sure. Uh, before we leave, being a uh, basketball coach as well as a uh, fly fishing conservationist, who can tell me what, why fish do not like to play basketball? Come on, somebody has to know this. It's because they're afraid of the nets, of course. Yeah, another dad joke. Yeah. Eric right, gets kind of a, a good... got, somebody really likes basketball. I forgot who it was, though. I can uh, see that from the, from the pictures, nobody is smiling or laughing at that joke. That's, that's my goal. <laughs> Count yourself successful, my friend. <laughs> uh, you're very successful. Uh, 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 too funny. Too funny. All right. Well, I hope everybody has a great week. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing more 
uh, particularly in our scavenger hunt and more pictures of um, the features that you're observing on the rivers. So bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.